of why it is that after 10 years of a working medical marijuana system, you have to go back to court and fight for the right to grow that these patients thought they already had. Well, let, <clears throat> let me just say, historically, to start off with, the, in British Columbia, where I am, the Compassion Clubs uh, started and were based, <clears throat> Riel Kapler was very involved in the BC Compassion Club in Vancouver, was based on Regulation 53 of the Narcotic Control Regulations, which is the regulation that all doctors can use to uh, prescribe, administer, authorize the use of any narcotic then defined under the Narcotic Control Act for any medical condition that they're treating the patient for. And so the Compassion Clubs grew up making sure that patients had something from their doctor where the growers and the, the clubs that were effectively dealing uh, were exposed to possible prosecution. Uh, senators, uh, other politicians came through and nobody wanted to bust the compassion clubs. The, the last thing the police want is to be on the news being accused of taking away people's medicine. If you're a front for organized crime or if you're overproducing or things like that, different question. But generally the police are smart enough that they don't want to be on the news and look bad for taking away people's medicine. So I mention that because in the Allard case, um, which comes way, way later in the scenario, because what was going on in Ontario while the Compassion Clubs were developing under Regulation 53 was the Terry Parker case and establishing essentially that if you uh, are medically approved, your doctor is approving you for the use of cannabis, that the government had to create this exemption because you were putting people in a position where they would have to choose between their liberty and their health. And so either they get arrested because they're using their medicine or they had to forgo their medicine. And the court said that was being done to these people and it was being done in a way that was not in accordance with principles of fundamental justice, which is the violation of Section 7 of the Charter. So. We are in a situation that John just described where the government decides to take away the right to personally produce. And the Ontario Court of Appeal made it clear, for technical reasons I won't go into, the, the, the cultivation or production charge wasn't in front of the Court of Appeal, but they said if it was, they would have clearly stated that that was part of the ambit and scope of the right that existed to avoid having your constitutional rights violated. So the right to produce is established. It was reaffirmed in the Murnock case here in the Ontario Court of Appeal last year that that was the ambit and scope of this, of this right to avoid the violation of your constitutional rights. So the government decides to take away personal production and production by a caregiver if you're unable to produce for yourself, which were fundamental uh, carried forward from the Parker case into the MMAR, as John has described them. So that is the main purpose of the Allard case, is to prevent that from being repealed, uh, the personal production and the right of somebody to have a caregiver produce for them if they can't do it for themselves. We don't oppose licensed producers, so the, the MMPR is not uh, being attacked other than it again limits to dried marijuana, which is, we'll get to probably later in the program, the Smith case in BC, extracts and so on. And it also imposes limits on your personal possession when you're out and about. And so that's what Allard is about, to try and maintain personal production and caregiver, not limit to dried marijuana or have possession limits. And it's a constitutional challenge, so technically we only need one person, but we have uh, two patients and a third patient who has a designated grower. And that patient also has a production site change of license uh, problem, which I know is a problem for many despite the injunction, and we'll probably get into that a little later as well. Thank you, John. <clears throat> I want to move uh, next to Riel and ask, uh, in the research you've been doing, uh, what are some of the, the positives but also some of the negative impacts that
uh, patients are facing or expect to be facing uh, as they transition into the MMPR if they have to do so? Yeah, so the, um, the main study I'm working on now is called the Canary Study, Cannabis Access Regulation Study, and it's assessing the impact of the MMPR on patient access to cannabis for medical purposes. Um, it's a national survey, it's longitudinal, so we're looking at six months past the kind of October 1st, which has been now, April, May, then six months, and then another six months after that. Um, we have people who have been accessing under the MMAR, people who are accessing under the MMPR, people who are accessing under neither program, and also people who aren't yet accessing or maybe never will access cannabis, but have the same kind of medical conditions as the other patients who are accessing medical cannabis. So the goal of the MMPR is to ensure reasonable access. And in the regulations, reasonable access isn't defined. And so part of doing this kind of um, patient-centered research is to help have patients define what reasonable access is and to also measure if access is indeed reasonable. So Health Canada has a measurement and evaluation program for the program, but it's not looking at um, patients' experiences and what they're accessing. It's just looking at if licensed producers are producing a certain quantity of cannabis that can meet the needs of patients who are enrolled in the program. It's not looking at patients that are not enrolled in the program and the barriers they could face. So um, in terms of what reasonable access is and defining it from a patient perspective, there's different dimensions of access that are important. So there's availability. So is there enough quantity, which is something that Health Canada is looking at? Is there an adequate supply? Utilization. How many people are utilizing it compared to the people that need it? So, you know, we had about 40,000 people under the MMPR, MMAR, and, but we know that there's estimates of about a million people who report, self-report using cannabis for medical purposes. So in, that, in those terms, with, you know, what was utilization like under the MMPR and what will it be like under the MMPR? There's also effectiveness and um, relevance. So the products that are being provided, are they relevant to patients' needs? Do they help? Do they impact their health? Are patients satisfied with those products? And there's also equity, which is really important. So equity is looking at social justice around healthcare. So are the people who need it able to access it? And are the needs of the people who are most marginalized and vulnerable, are they able to access it? So that's kind of looking at a patient perspective of access and reasonable access. So some of the research we've been doing in the past has been around the MMAR, because that's been around. And there was a study called the CAMP study, Cannabis Access for Medical Purposes, that was led by Zach, Dr. Zachary Walsh at UBC. And um, there's also, uh, that was a, a, qu a quantitative study. There's about 700 patients across Canada who were accessing both under the MMAR and not. And then there's also a more qualitative study, which was called HEMP, the Health Effects of Medical Marijuana Project, and that was uh, talking to patients. Um, and what we found was, in terms of availability, under the MMAR, about 60% of people were um, producing for themselves, were producing under the, the personal production licenses. 20% had designated producers, 10% were getting from Health Canada, and 10% were a mystery as to where they were getting it. Um, but of the people who were under the MMAR, 80% were, were getting from dispensaries as well, and 60% from friends and other sources. So now under the MMPR, we're seeing those, those you know, main sources, uh, especially of personal production, is gone. So in terms of availability, that might be an issue. And the dispensaries are still not part of the legal regulatory framework. So we'll see with the LPs under the licensed producers under the MMPR if the availability will be adequate. Um, utilization, um, again, I was saying that you know under the MMAR only 40,000 patients were authorized, which represented less than 5% of people who report using for cannabis, and that doesn't even take into consideration those who could possibly benefit from it. So we'll see that the estimates under the MMPR is that by 24, 24 so in 10 years there's going to be 450,000 authorized patients. We'll see what that is and how that compares to need. And barriers to access are really key. And the two key barriers are physicians, 
and people being able to get the, the necessary documentation. And we found in studies that 50% of patients reported having difficulty getting their doctor's approval or necessary documentation. And 40% were actually having to seek out new physicians for this. Um, we will see what that's like under the MMPR. And the, the, the biggest um, barrier is financial barriers, and that's kind of where the DPLs and PPLs come in that are part of the Aller case that John Conroy was talking about. So those are going to be gone, and those were the, the most cost-effective options for patients. So um, we found in our studies that 70% of people who earn less than $20,000 in income are having difficulties financial difficulties accessing cannabis. But it's not just the people in the lowest income bracket, it's all income brackets that are having difficulties. So 30% of people who earn over 60,000 a year are also experiencing difficulties. And of people in the lowest income bracket, under 20,000, 50% are having to choose between their access of medicine and other necessities. So we'll look at how that goes under the MMPR. Um, we know that there's estimates that there's gonna be a 30% reduction in people who, um, relative amount of people who are accessing cannabis legally, and that's because of cost. So there's already a prediction that there's gonna be problems in access around cost. There's no subsidies anymore, so under the old system, when we had PPS, they were subsidized by the Canadian government for shipping and production. The new licensed producers don't have those subsidies, so the cost, you know, are gonna be harder. You know, PPS was able to provide it at $5 a gram. That might be difficult. And doctors are still charging uh, patients. And um, in terms of satisfaction in the products that are being um, presented, again, in our studies, they show that the preferred sources were dispensaries and personal production. So dispensaries are still not under the legal framework, and personal production is you know, hopefully going to be saved by the Aller case uh, because that, those are the preferred sources. And in terms of equity, it has been shown that a free market for the distribution of health care does not meet the criteria for equity in health care and justice. Only the people who can afford it or happen to get charity are able to access it in that situation. So um, we've seen also in our studies that the cost disproportionately obviously affects people with lower income and also disproportionately affects people with lower health status. So we will see what happens under the MMPR. We will be able to compare it to the research we have for the MMAR. Thank you, Riel. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Mark, I'd like to turn it over to you now. <clears throat> I'm sure everyone wants to hear a little bit about uh, your licensed producer uh, program and also the association that you've put together. And primarily what we'd be interested to know is, uh, based on these issues that John and Riel have pointed out uh, in terms of access through doctors, and access uh, both quantitatively for, for financial reasons and qualitatively in terms of selection and, and quality and things of that nature. Uh, just how can this commercial industry respond to what seems to be very apparent problems facing patients? Well, from the industry association, what um, us as licensed producers have started to do is organize ourselves to make sure that uh, the regulations that are in front of us we're able to follow, but follow succinctly so we don't create confusion in the marketplace. So we don't want some LPs advertising, some others. We don't want anybody in the association supporting or endorsing payment of physicians for validation. There's a lot of nuances to this new industry now that have been created. And what we try to do is organize, to have a common voice to speak to the regulator because one of us having one issue and when we speak commonly, we find that there are common opportunities to improve, to provide better access, to provide um, lower cost access. And we know that with uh, the work that Mr. Conroy has done and um, the, the requirements for access and the affordability issue, as an industry association, we know that's our number one issue. We know that collaboratively we have to find a way to um, create affordability. Um, at Peace Naturals it was where we started, but we started by having this uh, great dialogue with the clientele and understanding there's a real need for it. We, we are a business, so we don't apologize for having our limitations, but anybody, and I think a lot of other LPs have done this now, you can get at least one gram a day subsidized 50%. So from us it's $3 a gram. It's not enough. We know it's not enough, but at least it's a starting point. We're approaching this compassionately. 
And as an industry association, we want to make sure that there is a common message. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that all have the same regulations to work under, but there's interpretation. So as this interpretation becomes more finite, and we have a, a succinct way that everybody is going to market the same way, or at least have a level playing field, it will be easier for people to understand. And what we're experiencing as a new industry, as commercial growers, is truly unlike what a lot of people have experienced under MMAR. There's a lot of challenges, extraordinary amount of requirements, and quite honestly, some substantial costs. And we will be able to provide the breadth of variety that everybody wants. It just takes time. It's not that we're developing the varieties. Many people that come into MMPR have come from MMAR, so they had genetics, they were allowed to bring them. But growing on in scale and having an inventory that people that become your clientele, they want the exact same medicine when they want it, that's a really big obligation and responsibility. So we're, as Peace Naturals, we started off trying to be everything to everybody. We opened our doors with 14 different varieties. But in limited square footage, because we weren't ready to expand yet, all we did was let people down. So mea culpa, sorry, we can't do that, but we know we can consistently give you eight. And it's not as good as 14, it's not as good as 40, but it's eight and that if you're a client with Peace Naturals or any other LP, your expectation is if you sell this to me and I like it, I want to be able to get it again. So um, I think the, the common message from the CMCIA is we want to work closely with the regulator to talk about things like um, edibles and to have not to be smoking something that is nothing else that we should smoke, but allow them to understand the safety elements, allow them to understand what we're doing from workplace safety, product safety, allow, allow them to understand our controls. We're working today with um, a, a pharmacopoeia or a guideline that's based on 1% moisture. Yeah, nobody likes to consume something in cannabis as 1% moisture. So when you get to that 7, 8%, how are you gonna handle it? What truly is a shelf life? What happens with waste product? What is waste? Um, we have a differing view from the regulator, but the good news is they're all ears. So as we have a common voice as a CMCIA, we have a place to go speak to people and we're being heard and this will be a process, but I'm, I'm truly very optimistic that what will come out of MMPR is an excellent, uh, professional, well-regulated, uh, and quite honestly, an industry that will be the envy of the global cannabis market.